Hello, and welcome to the Film Jerk Podcast. I am your host, Edward Havens. Originally, I was planning on this episode to be a deep dive into one of my favorite movies of the 1980s, the Tim Robbins John Cusack comedy Tapeheads, which I will still be doing. However, as I was looking at some of the data about the podcast after publishing our most recent show on the films of August 1986, I noticed that we were coming up on the first anniversary of the podcast, and I took another listen to that first test episode we ran. I've learned a lot about podcasting in the past year, and that first episode made me cringe even as I was publishing it, hearing how little I understood at the time. So I have rewritten the original script, and I'm re-recording this episode. If you've heard it before, hopefully it'll sound better and be more informative. If you haven't, I hope you'll enjoy. The topic of that episode was the Weintraub Entertainment Group. Of all the uniquely 1980s distribution companies, this was one of the biggest and quickest flameouts in a decade full of big companies and massive flameouts. The Weintraub Entertainment Company was the brainchild of Jerry Weintraub. Before getting involved in movies, the Brooklyn-born Weintraub got his start in the entertainment industry as a talent agent at William Morris before moving on to MCA, where, for a time, he was the assistant to the king of Hollywood himself, Lou Wasserman, who Weintraub would long consider to be a father figure. Weintraub would later go on to form his own talent management company alongside Bernie Brillstein and Marnie Coomer, where he would represent such artists as The Carpenters, Bob Denver, Bob Dylan, Elvis Presley, Led Zeppelin, and Frank Sinatra. It would be his long-standing relationship with Bob Denver that would facilitate his move into motion pictures. Hosting a party for his client in New York City, Weintraub was introduced to Robert Altman, who was having trouble getting financing for his latest film. Over a shared joint, Altman told Weintraub about his country music-centered idea, and Weintraub was hooked. But no studio at the time wanted to work with the pain-in-the-ass director like Altman. So Weintraub found the $2.2 million needed to produce the film through private investors. That film, Nashville, would become a critical and commercial success, reviving Altman's career and winning an Academy Award for Keith Carradine's song, I'm Easy. The film would also be nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, and snag supporting actress nods for Ronnie Blakely and Lily Tomlin. Weintraub's next foray into motion pictures would be with his longtime client, Bob Denver, producing Carl Reiner's smash hit, Oh God. Weintraub would then produce the James Dean-themed drama, September 30, 1955, the controversial William Friedkin movie, Cruising, and the disastrous Barbara Streisand, Gene Hackman romantic comedy, Up All Night, before finding success with first-time director Barry Levinson's Diner but it would be his next film that would catapult him into the next chapter of his film career. 1984's Karate Kid was not expected to be a major success, despite director John G. Avildsen's success with a similar underdog sports movie eight years earlier, Rocky. But like Rocky, a lot of people saw themselves in Daniel LaRusso, and the film would go on to gross more than 11 times its $8 million budget, and secure an Academy Award nomination for Pat Morita. And because of the success of The Karate Kid, Weintraub was hired by MGM Pictures owner Kirk Kerkorian in November of 1985 to help revive the United Artists label, which, at the time, would have an occasional hit like War Games or Poltergeist, but was mostly dormant when there wasn't a James Bond film to sell. Kerkorian had agreed to sell MGM and United Artists to Ted Turner a few months earlier. Turner wanted the fabled MGM and United Artists film libraries for broadcasts on his superstation WTBS, but didn't necessarily want the studios themselves. Krikorian would buy back most of the re remaining United Artists non-library assets from Turner and essentially start a new company called United Artists. And Weintraub would be in charge of building this new iteration. But Kerkorian and Weintraub would butt heads on exactly how to build up the new United Artists, and Weintraub would leave the company not five months later. But the itch to run his own studio stuck around Weintraub, 
and in February of 1987, he would form the Weintraub Entertainment Group. With nearly half a billion dollars in financing from Columbia Pictures, Cineplex Odeon Cinemas, Coca-Cola, U.S. Tobacco, and others, along with a $145 million seven-year credit line with Bank of America, Weintraub set out to produce and release seven to eight films a year through Columbia Pictures with budgets in the $12 to $15 million range. The lifeline for the Weintraub Entertainment Group was amazingly short. From their founding day to their final film release before going bankrupt, they lasted only two years and ten months and released just six feature films into theaters. But unlike most hit-and-run distributors, you probably remember most, if not all, of the movies if you grew up in the late 80s and probably have a certain fondness for at least one of them. Let's take a look at the films. Their first release was Luc Besson's The Big Blue. See traveled halfway around the world to find a man she only met once. But this was no ordinary man. How is he going to breathe? He isn't. It's incredible. All the blood is concentrated in his brain. It doesn't even feed his limbs anymore. It scares me when you look at the sea like that. He looks strange, doesn't he? You're so crazy about him, you don't see the truth. Don't think of Jacques as a human being. He's from another world. He was a man about to discover the secret of the Big Blue. August 19th at a theater near you. This was his third feature film and his first in English. The $13.5 million American production was one of the country's biggest homegrown hits, and Weintraub would pay its production company and distributor Gamon $3 million for the American distribution rights. The story told the heavily fictionalized true life friendship and rivalry of champion freedivers Jacques Mayol and Enzo Mayorca, played by Jean-Marc Barr and Besson regular Jean Renault. But even with an amazing ocean cinematography captured by Carlo Varini and the inclusion of American actress Rosanna Arquette as a love interest of one of the divers, the Big Blue would barely sell enough tickets in America to cover the acquisition costs, let alone the millions spent on film prints and advertising. In its opening weekend... The Big Blue would open in 12th place with a dismal $1.6 million on 967 screens and would lose nearly 72% of its audience in its second week, earning less on 881 screens than Martin Scorsese's controversial The Last Temptation of Christ would earn its first weekend on just 48 screens. By week three, it was no longer being tracked. Even Mac and Me widely considered to be the worst movie of 1988, would gross more than double in America what The Big Blue would earn. The Big Blue also starred Griffin Dunn and, in his final film role, Paul Shinar, who would pass away from an AIDS-related illness less than two months after the film opened in America. Fresh Horses would arrive in theaters in November 1988. The first actual production of the Weintraub Entertainment Group. This is based on an off-Broadway play that starred Susie Amos and Craig Sheffer. The movie version would re-team Pretty in Pink co-stars Molly Ringwald and Andrew McCarthy 
and the story of a college student on the fast track of life who sees himself about to lose everything when he falls for a free-spirited girl. Molly Ringwald. Sometimes I can go through a whole deck of cars and tell which ones are red and which ones are black. Andrew McCarthy. How do you do that? Do it by heat. He wasn't born rich, but he was about to marry the right girl. My daughter and Matt to their engagement. And may June come quickly. <laughs> All he had to do was forget about Jewel. I finally found my old blue jean. Molly Ringwald, Andrew McCarthy. Not in my house. Not with her. Fresh horses. Coming soon. A $14 million production, including Ringwald's first million dollar payday, Fresh Horses was directed by David Anspa, a television director with episodes of St. Elsewhere and Miami Vice to his credit, who had made his feature directing debut two years earlier with the Indiana basketball drama Hoosiers. In its opening weekend, November 18th, Fresh Horses would come in sixth place with a $3 million gross on 1,272 screens, just behind Neil Jordan's truly lousy high spirits, which would do almost twice the per-screen average of Fresh Horses on only two-thirds of the screens. Like the Big Blue, box office tracking would end after the second week, having earned only $6.6 million. If anyone watches the film today, it's mostly because of the early film roles for Ben Stiller and Viggo Mortensen. My Stepmother is an Alien was their big Christmas release, and on the surface, had what it took to be a hit film. Stephen Mills, research astronomer. Beautiful! Married to his work. Ah! Then one night, he sent a radar signal into another galaxy. Now they're sending someone back. If we don't get that transmission from him, our planet is doomed. Well, hi. She's got 48 hours to save her civilization. And decipher ours. Mm, thank you. Delicious. I was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Well, I must be boring the pants off you. No. They're still on. Good. We're making progress, sir. She's never made love. You're so stupid. We could have been doing this the whole time. We only met three hours ago. And never made breakfast. Daddy, don't you think this is pretty strange? Marry him. Where did she get a wedding dress on two hours' notice? Did she just carry one around with her in case of emergencies? Daddy, you married a person from another planet. Dan Aykroyd. Your stepmother is not an alien. Jim Basinger. For an astronomer, you have the most wonderful fibers. And you got yourself a handful right now. <laughs> John Lovitz. Baby! Bye! My stepmother is an alien. A comedy of cosmic proportions. Directed by Richard Benjamin, the actor turned filmmaker who had already made one of the decade's truly great movies, My Favorite Year, My Stepmother is an Alien stars Dan Aykroyd as a scientist looking for new ways to send radio waves into deep space. One of his experimental transmissions is captured by an alien race who sends a representative in the form of Kim Basinger, in the tightest red dress ever photographed on celluloid, to learn more about these terrestrial beings. But the fates were not to be with this film. On its opening weekend, December 9th, My Stepmother is an Alien would gross less than $2.1 million on 1,106 screens. It would manage to stay in the box office top 12 for four whole weeks, eventually grossing $13.85 million dollars. But with a production budget of $26 million, it would be Weintraub's third loser in a row. But it would become the first of many on-screen pairings between Allison Hannigan and Seth Green, and would also feature John Lovitz as Aykroyd's brother, Harry Shearer as the voice of Carl Sagan, and future acting nominee Juliette Lewis in her big screen acting debut. 1989 should have started the Weintraub Entertainment Group with a big bang. This life was a symphony of spending. This one. 
out. I'll take the rest. I started my new meaningful life today, and I bought a whole new meaningful wardrobe to go with it. Until her husband stopped the music. You never give me an ounce of credit for anything I do. That's because you never do anything! Well, then I guess I'm going to do something right now. Approve! Mom's gonna be our new troop leader. Who are you? Uh, Phyllis Neffler, Troop Beverly Hills. Now, she's changing her style. Well, girls, are you ready to rough it? From Rodeo Drive. I can't let you take the girls out there alone. Why not? Because you get lost in your walk-in closet. The cookie drives. That jamboree thing sounds fabulous. Mm. My trip is definitely going. What is a jamboree? From room service. Is this what you call roughing it? One bathroom for nine people? Yes. The public service. Today I am here to demonstrate for you CPR. Lie down and open your mouth. Last time I did this, I got more than a patch for it. And from high society. <laughs> Do you like people to call you dictator or just dick? To high adventure. I'm sure it's very nice to know how to live in the forest and eat bark. You can prance these little princesses through Beverly Hills all you want. Hi. But you will never really be a real wilderness girl. We'll be fine. We're through Beverly Hills. Shelley Long. What an adventure. Isn't nature fabulous, girls? Troop Beverly Hills. She's not. A babe in the woods. Can we just quit now? Not until we sing Kumbaya. She's hilarious. She's captivating. She's wonderful, the ads for Troop Beverly Hills promised us. And in a sense, the film did deliver. Phyllis Neffler, the rich divorcee, who would end up leading a ragtag group of messed up rich girls to becoming awesome wilderness girls, would end up becoming Shelley Long's best film role. And Troop Beverly Hills would feature early film roles for such young actresses as Carla Gugino, Jenny Lewis, Kelly Martin, and Tori Spelling. Yet the film, which has become something of a cult classic over the years, would not be the hit Weintraub needed. On its opening weekend, March 24th, the film would open in 7th place, with $2.3 million on 964 screens. It would stay in the top 10 films for three weeks before tracking ended, finishing with a gross of $8.5 million. But with a production budget of $18 million, the losses would continue to stack up. She's Out of Control would become Weintraub's second release of 1989. Some. Things about to happen to Doug Simpson's little girl. Happy birthday. <laughs> Dad. Something swift. Something shocking. Something with a brand new learner's permit. Something called Spike. Kyle. Mickey. I'm Barry. I'm Sonny. My name's Dad. Hello. I'm Lester. My name is Still. Doug, you can't stop life from happening. Oh, no. I can sure slow it down a bit. Oh, yeah, how? How? Total control. Total control. And it's going on all over America. Doctor, what's happening to these girls? It's boys that are happening to these girls, Mr. Simpson. Now, can one average American father put a stop to what Mother Nature's already started? Sex, sex, sex. Is that all women think about? I've never been this popular with boys before. It's kind of a kick having this power. Before it stops him. Dad? What are you doing here? She cannot stay a little girl forever. She's growing up. Well, he's sure gonna try. Tony Danza, Catherine Hicks, and Amy Dolan. She's out of control. Believe it or not, Tony Danza was once considered a big star. During the 1987-88 television season, Who's the Boss? was the sixth most popular show and would see its highest ratings during its eight-year run. Made during his hiatus between this season and the next, She's Out of Control would find Danza as a put-upon dad who can't handle his 15-year-old daughter going from an ugly duckling to a total hottie thanks to a makeover from his girlfriend played by Katherine Hicks. Amy Dolans, the daughter of Monkey star Mickey Dolans, had her first starring role as Daddy's Little Girl, the original title of the film. While 19 at the time of filming, 
Scenes such as the one where Dolan's, as the 15-year-old character, runs around the beach in a skimpy one-piece bathing suit with her ample bosom bouncing around in all directions as men of all ages leer at her was uncomfortable 30 years ago. But with Stan Dragotti, the talentless hack responsible for such crap fests as Love at First Bite and The Man with One Red Shoe at the helm, it's little surprise that the film would mind such low fruit for an attempted chuckle. On its opening weekend, April 14th, She's Out of Control would become the Weintraub Entertainment Group's highest opener, opening to fourth place with $3.65 million on 987 screens, just below the other teen comedy that would open the same weekend, a little film from a first-time director, Cameron Crowe's Say Anything. After four weeks in the top 12 before tracking ended, She's Out of Control ended up grossing $12.06 million, barely more than its $12 million budget. Say Anything would play for eight weeks in theaters and bring in more than $21.5 million on a $16 million budget. The supporting cast here would include future Twin Peaks star Dana Ashbrook, future Saved by the Bell star Dustin Diamond, and a Canadian actor who would make his indelible mark on entertainment a few years later on a little show called Friends, Matthew L. Perry. Listen to Me would be the final Weintraub Entertainment Group release of 1989 and of all time. It's about a kid from Oklahoma, a bartender's daughter, and the son of a wealthy senator. You're a thoroughbred son. You're coming out of the gate. It's about a man who's going to push them to be the best they can be. What would you say if I told you that you could be debating in front of the Supreme Court this spring? They could be the future leaders of America. At 95, it's too late, Robert! Don't you dare! But there's a few distractions along the way. What did Tucker mean when he said lifting cars? He's just dying of a terminal lack of sex. Why do you work so hard to hide this beauty from the world? How would you like it if I asked you why such an intelligent man as yourself dates such shallow people? Talk, look out! We can't win this thing on facts, then we damn well better win it on drama. What drama? You'll have to find that in yourself. Kirk Cameron. Oh, jeez, I want to go down with this right there. Jamie Kurtz. This is the greatest honor of our lives. Roy Scheider. Now take the other side. Tim Quill. Teenagers are as sexually inquisitive as they've always been. In Listen to Me, it's all about real life. Douglas Day Stewart, the writer of The Blue Lagoon and An Officer and a Gentleman, would be given the opportunity to direct his second film after 1984's Thief of Hearts, both of which he also wrote. Listen to Me stars Kirk Cameron and Jamie Gertz as two college students who, under the tutelage of their debate coach played by Roy Scheider, would find themselves winning the chance to debate the issue of abortion in front of the Supreme Court. The movie is as ridiculous as it sounds, and laughable throughout, thanks in large part to Kirk Cameron's ludicrous hairstyle of the day and even more preposterous oaky accent, which appears and disappears whenever it suits the actor, even within the same scene. On its opening weekend, May 5th, Listen to Me would open in sixth place with $1.78 million on 1,306 screens. After two weeks before tracking ended, Listen to Me would end up grossing $4.3 million. The movie is so forgotten that there is no accurate information about its budget. Suffice to say that it would have been higher than $4.3 million. Weintraub attempted to stay afloat as an entertainment entity in part by buying the British company Thorn EMI Films Library of 2,000 plus titles from Canon Films in May of 1987, but a heavily British library of movies with only a handful of A-list titles like Sidney Lumet's Murder on the Orient Express and the 1978 Best Picture winner The Deer Hunter, no matter what would have been in store for movie distribution in the future 20 or 30 years down the road. With more than $91 million in outstanding bond debts due by September 1990, the Weintraub Entertainment Group filed for bankruptcy. 
Reading the list of debtors for the Weintraub Entertainment Group is like a greatest hits of the 1987 and 2008 financial meltdowns. $22.5 million was owed to the federal government via the sale of junk bonds to savings and loan banks that would need to be bailed out by the Resolution Trust Fund and another $13 million in junk bonds owned to two more thrifts that would later be bailed out by the RTF. Those junk bonds were underwritten by Bear Stearns and sold by Drexel Burnham Lambert junk bond chief Michael Milken, a Weintraub friend, with more than $3 million in bonds owned by an insurance company operated by Milken's second cousin. Other debtors during the Weintraub bankruptcy proceeding, including Batman writer Sam Hamm, who was owed $280,000 for writing a draft for a planned film adaptation of the 1960s British series The Avengers, and $100,000 to Joe Esterhaus for his screenplay Jade. Also left abandoned due to the end of the company was an Oliver Stone-led $29 million production of Evita, which was supposed to start shooting in Argentina in early 1989 with Meryl Streep as Eva Peron, before riots in Argentina forced a delay in production. There was also an adaptation of the Peter Pan story, parts of which would be sold off to Columbia TriStar Pictures and folded into their own Peter Pan adaptation, the Steven Spielberg-directed Hook, and the theatrical release of The Gods Must Be Crazy too, which would be sold off to Columbia Pictures as part of the bankruptcy sale. But don't feel so bad for Jerry Weintraub. He would end up producing all the future Karate Kid movies, as well as the George Strait movie Pure Country, 1994's The Specialist, starring Sylvester Stallone and Sharon Stone, the 1998 adaptation of The Avengers, starring Uma Thurman, Ray Fiennes, and Sean Connery, which ended up not using the Sam Hamm script mentioned before, and 1998's Blade Runner pseudo-sidequel Soldier, starring Kurt Russell, as well as three Oceans films starring Brad Pitt and Weintraub friend George Clooney. Weintraub would also have small acting roles in all three Oceans movies, as well as Vegas Vacation, which he produced, and in The Firm, which he did not produce. Douglas McGrath, the Oscar-nominated co-writer of Bullets Over Broadway, would make a documentary about Jerry Weintraub called His Way, which would air on HBO in 2011. Two years later, he would produce the Emmy-winning HBO movie about Liberace, starring Michael Douglas and Matt Damon, and, would, and he would see another Emmy win for his next and final production, the Showtime documentary series Years of Living Dangerously, which focused on global warming. Jerry Weintraub would pass away at his home in Santa Barbara on July 6, 2015. And while his attempt to start his own powerhouse distribution company would be amongst the shortest-lived entities of the 1980s, his three Emmy wins, a National Association of Theater Owners Award for Producer of the Year, and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame attest to his longevity and other success in the motion picture industry. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon. The Film Jerk Podcast has been written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens. As we are an independent podcast without sponsors or a network of websites to help promote the show, we rely on word of mouth to get the word out about the show. Please, help get the word out. Please post about the Film Jerk Podcast on your socials. Please rate and review the show on your favorite podcast source. Good ratings and reviews help get the podcast higher rankings, which help get the show seen by more potential listeners. And, as always, I look forward to your comments about the show. You can leave me a note on this podcast's page at filmjerk.com, or you can leave me a message on my Twitter feeds at Edward A. Havens or at filmjerk. The Film Jerk Podcast has been a production of Idiosyncratic Entertainment. Thank you again. Good night.